everyone. So a couple of months ago, I put out a call for questions on my Instagram account just to do a little bit of a Q&A about the world of film photography. So today I'm going to answer those questions finally. Apologize to anyone who sent them over. It took me a while to put this together. But a couple of notes as well. I'm going to actually timestamp uh, some things below, some specific questions, because this video is probably going to run a little bit longer. So check that out if you want to find your question or find any specific ones. And then also over on my website, I'll put a link below. I just released the first issue of what I'm calling Field Notes. That's an email series that I'm doing. And I put some of the questions in there as well, just because there were a lot of them. But I'm actually thinking of continuing doing that. So asking for questions and doing a Q&A session, maybe one every kind of third issue that I send out. So yeah, it'd be cool if you check that out. There's a bunch of other kind of really good, valuable content in there that I send out. So you can check out the link below and subscribe if it's something you're interested in. But for today, let's jump into some of these questions. Okay, so first question, is there anything but personal preference that puts you off of rangefinders? And anyone who watches this channel knows that I'm not a huge fan of rangefinders. And for me, that really just comes down to per, I would say precision with framing. So the reason I really like SLRs is because for the most part, I can see everything in the frame and I can kind of frame right to the edges and I know what's gonna be in there and there's not really any distractions. And the thing that I don't really like about rangefinders is I can see beyond the frame line. So it's always kind of distracting me. And I know that's actually a, a positive for a bunch of people, but it, I think it all comes down to kind of the style of photography that you shoot. I know for me, it's always distracted me just being able to kind of see beyond the frame lines. I like to just, you know, look through that viewfinder and kind of see the edges of my composition and, you know, decide what's going to be in and what's going to be out. Obviously, again, that all depends on how much coverage your viewfinder has, but that is the biggest thing for me uh, that's made me kind of prefer the SLR route. Okay, next question. How important is editing style versus content in an image? I would say they're both very important. And I mean, everyone would probably decide differently which one's more important, but I think a good goal is just to strive for having both in an image. So having strong content and also a really kind of strong style or embracing your style. You know, I think if you have an image that has, you know, strong content, but it's missing your style, it's going to be lacking. And then I think if you have an image that has a ton of style, but is lacking content, it's also not going to be that strong. Um, I would say maybe you could get away with an image that has really good subject matter that's lacking a bit of style. But I think you should really kind of aim to just incorporate both to the best of your abilities, play on kind of your strengths um, when it comes to style and also try and find the most interesting subject matter uh, or whatever interests you the most as an artist. I think that's what's really important. Okay, relatively new to scanning, any tips? Mine sometimes look muddy or not as sharp as lab scan. So obviously I'm not sure what type of film you're scanning or what your scanner is, but let's just assume you are scanning 35 mil or 120 on a flatbed scanner. And I think first off, when it comes to muddy scans, it really all depends on the scanning software that you're using. I mean, Silverfast or ViewScan or Epson Scan or Negative Lab Pro, they're all gonna give you different results when it comes to contrast and colors. So really it's kind of just experimenting and finding which one you enjoy the most and then sticking with that one. Uh, but when it comes to sharpening, that is something that's really important and I think people sometimes don't realize the amount you actually have to sharpen your scans at home, especially on a flatbed, especially with 35 millimeter film. So I had someone reach out to me the other day and they were wondering why their scans were so soft. And they actually thought that they might actually be at a focus, like they missed focus, but it was just 35 mil scan on a flatbed with no sharpening applied. So um, you'll see if you even pull them into Lightroom and start to hit them with some aggressive sharpening, uh, you'll see the kind of grain start to appear as you sharpen them. And you really do have to be quite heavy with it uh, if you're using a flatbed. As you start to get higher up with say like um, 645 or 6667, uh, you don't have to sharpen as heavy, but really with 35 mil, you have to hit it pretty hard. So maybe in a future video, that's something I'll, I'll look at is just sharpening uh, scans that are done at home. Because uh, I think it can really throw people off. You know, you, you get a flatbed scanner, you start doing your scans for the first time, and you're like, whoa, these things are super soft. Um, so yeah, very important. Okay, so this one, I'm assuming that this is joking, but we're gonna answer it anyways, just for fun. So it's, or sorry, it's help me make my photos not a taupe 
total dumpster trash fire. <laughs> so I hope you aren't serious because probably the first piece of advice that I would have is to not call your photos a total dumpster trash fire. Uh, but I want to answer this anyways, just for fun. Uh, like I said, I'm assuming you're not serious, but it brings up a good point, And that's kind of like mindset with your work. And I think it, it's really important to kind of be confident in your work uh, and take your work serious. And But also just accept the fact that we are always learning, all of us, and that uh, no one is a pro or should feel like they've kind of mastered it all. Obviously, there's people who are incredibly skilled, who have put in the work and who have learned a ton across their career, but we're always constantly learning and you don't have to feel like you should know it all. Uh, so I would say have confidence in your work and just accept that uh, there's things you don't know and that there's things you need to learn um, and that no one's work is ever perfect. Okay, so the next question, this is kind of a trio. I lumped a bunch of these together because they're all kind of similar. This is to do with making money off of photography. So the first one is how to start selling my film photographs. The next one is making money off of photography. And then the third one is where should individuals start with the goal of being a freelancer? And how? So I think something that's really important to think of and often forgotten is just like, what value are you providing for someone or what problem are you solving? And I think sometimes in the photography world or the creative world, people can just, you know, think, I'll just grow my audience and somehow I'll start making money. But I mean, that definitely doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. I think it's really important to kind of detach from the whole making money thing and first think about how can I just provide value for people? So how can I be part of the community? What help can I offer? What can I do for other people? Just to get people even interested in your work that way. And I see this sometimes with like smaller brands and stuff like that. Not that I'm a marketing expert, but you know, they'll start up a, a new brand or a new company and instantly it's just their social media platforms are like this for sale, that for sale, 20% off, this and that. But they haven't taken any time yet to actually participate in the community and do things for other people. So I think you need to get people interested in what you're doing, but you need to do that in a really kind of genuine and authentic way where you're you're helping other people and you're being of value to other people. And then in return, people are going to want to support you when you finally ask them for something. So ask them to say, purchase something off of you. Uh, so there's this Gary V term, give, 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 take. And I mean, take sounds bad, but it's really ask. It's like, give value, give value, give value, give value. And then finally, when you go to ask, when you say, here's this book I'm releasing, people are going to want to buy it because they're going to be interested in it. So it's just, it's a long process and it shouldn't be about just selling things to people. It should be being part of the community and providing as much value as possible. And as a result, people are going to want to help support you and your craft. So I think that's really important. Uh, there's no kind of quick fix or short-term kind of answer for that one. Um, I think it's just you know, figuring out what, what kind of value you're going to provide, what kind of problem you can solve for people, and then just kind of doing that as much as possible. Okay, so next question is, do you think you could be happy with your work if you could only shoot 35 millimeter? I love questions like this because I'm always curious, like what situation are we in where I can only, like does medium format not exist or anything? But it's a fun question. I mean, a short, quick answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I shoot mostly six, seven, a little bit of four five nowadays, just because I have the options and those are what I like. But if none of those existed and 35 millimeter only existed, I would absolutely be happy. Um, for me right now, I like obviously the larger size negative and uh, the quality that comes with that with medium format, but also my way of working and process is pretty slow. So 10 images per roll is plenty. I don't need to, you know, go out and shoot more than that. So actually when I am shooting 35, it's a bit of a challenge to finish a roll. Uh, you know, it's a lot of exposures for me. But I mean, if that's all I could shoot, 100%, uh, it's a, still a great medium. Um, people have created amazing work on 35 mil. Uh, it's certainly not limiting, but I have the option. So six, seven, it is for me. Okay, how do I get a consistent look with film right out of the camera? And I'll answer this assuming that you're using like a digital post workflow. And my answer in that case would be um, you don't because you have to scan it. And it's more so getting a consistent workflow with scanning. Um, so your results are very similar. Um, I think all that you can do while you're shooting is just take whatever film stock you like working with, run some exposure tests, learn um which kind of exposure works best for scanning afterwards when it comes to density and stuff like that. That's really kind of the most 
consistent you can get with your actual exposures coming out of your camera or with the film coming out. But when you go to scan it, you it, you know, you could f- scan Portrait 400 with four different programs and get four different looks. So you really need to dial in, you know, what program works best for you, what correction software works best for you. And I think you can build up some really good consistency that way, but it does take time. So you would want to, you know, run some exposure tests on the film stock, scan from there, find a workflow that works best for you. Personally, for me, I'm using ViewScan and Negative Lab Pro, and I'm quite happy with it. I'm learning it to a point where I feel like I'm getting it dialed in quite a bit. Okay, do you ever change style within your work, and is it good to embrace change? And absolutely, I think it's really good to embrace change. For me, I feel like I'm at that point right now. Um, I think that we all kind of develop our voice over a certain amount of years. And I think there's things that don't change uh, in that regard. I think we all kind of start to build the style, but I think you can take it in different directions. And it's important not to just get stuck doing things how you always have, especially if you start to get bored with them, because that can lead to creative burnout. Um, So for me right now, I'm starting to dabble in black and white as I'm here in England and starting to create some new work and really enjoying where that's going. You know, there's a lot of kind of characteristics that are carrying over from my other work, which is what it's kind of all about. But, you know, I didn't come here and say, lock myself into a specific, you know, Portra 400 on 645 or something. Um, It took me a couple months of experimenting, going to different places, shooting different film stocks, and discovering that black and white seems to work well for the current project I'm doing. So I think it's really important to be flexible. You know, you're going to develop your style over time, but don't be afraid to make changes. You'll always carry certain things with you, uh, and you add to it as you experiment and try new things. So I think it's really important. Okay, next one is where do you see the film photography craze going? And I actually just did a podcast episode I think it just, if timing works out, it would have been released today. Inspired by this question, and I expanded on this a little bit, so go check that out if you're curious, but I'll try and answer it uh, quickly here. I see film only getting more popular, and personally, I think that's amazing. Um, I think that the amount of people I have met and the amount of stories I've heard of people just, you know, film photography reigniting people's careers, inspiring them in different directions, just the amount of kind of, you know, enjoyment and happiness it brings to people, I think is incredible. The podcast I did talks about the flip side of that, just where there are at times it seems like people who are trying to gatekeep this community, you know, complaining about film camera prices rising and all sorts of stuff like that. And I'm I always look at that and it I'm just like, it frustrates kind of the hell out of me. Because I'm like, what gives you the right to, you know, have some sort of special permission to shoot with, you know, this type of stuff. But now you can say no more people in because it's getting too expensive. So I think, you know, the popularity of film is leading to stuff obviously getting more expensive because we're using older equipment that is becoming more rare. Um, But that's just the reality of the situation when something's old and becomes in demand. So I think the craze is going to keep booming. I think it's amazing because I think it really does encourage creativity and it's inspired a lot of people. Uh, And the film community is awesome. There's a lot of great people, tons, tons of people supporting one another. uh, And I would just love to see more of that. Any advice on how to deal with a confidence crisis? I dealt with it all my life. So I don't know your situation. Obviously, Uh, I'm going to maybe answer this based on confidence lack of confidence with your work. So I would say that a lot of that often comes from like a fear of criticism. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that in the online world. And I think you just need to accept that if you're going to put your work out there online on social media, especially as your following starts to grow, there's just some people out there, a select few who feel the need to shit on other people's work and just be a dick about things. And the way that I look at, at it is anyone I know whose work that I respect and whose work that I admire, who's really kind of doing important things, they would never, ever take the time to go and knock someone down. If on the Actually, com- the complete opposite. They're the ones who are supporting people and encouraging people and help, helping people grow. So all these people out there who are, you know, talking behind people's backs or, you know, criticizing other people or shitting on people and stuff like that. I just look at it like those people are making it really easy for me to know who I don't want to associate myself with. 
So if you're going to put yourself out there, you need to accept that that's just going to happen. 99% of the people out there are encouraging and supportive, but the reality is, is you're just going to run into those people every now and then. Uh, but they're kind of just revealing more about themselves than anything. Uh, mostly taking out their displeasure, probably with their lack of progress or lack of action on you to try and make themselves feel better. So I would say just own your work, whatever it is you're interested in, embrace that. Don't apologize to anyone, you know, create what truly makes you happy. Uh, and if you do that long enough, you'll start to kind of get over that hump. And I think you'll start to really create important work. Any plans on doing photo books or zines in the future? Absolutely. I know I've talked about a book quite a bit uh, for my own work, and it is something that I do have in the works. Hopefully I'll have an announcement sometime in the near future. Uh, I'm just trying not to rush the process and I've been busy, but absolutely I want to release uh, a book and have plans to uh, with my American Southwest work. And then it's kind of taking a little bit of a different shape. So I may actually do some uh, like an issue or two of a zine in the future with some other work that I created in the past that maybe isn't going to fit how I thought it would. So uh, definitely plans for some content soon. Okay, what should beginners do most aside from practicing and learning from better work? I think this isn't like a specific action to take, but more so something to keep in mind. I, I've learned that kind of the most important things as an artist really comes down to patience and consistency. And I think nowadays, especially, there's this kind of instant gratification thing that people are chasing and people get caught up in you know expecting things to happen overnight and i think it's so important just to put in the work be patient and be consistent you know there's going to be low points and high points and things that don't work out how you want and it's just how it goes there's no avoiding that at all and i think you need to just keep making work keep challenging yourself keep pushing yourself uh, and just be patient i know it's going to take a long time but it actually goes by faster than you think and you will start to see some results you know, fairly quickly, even though it might seem like a long time. So patience and consistency, super important. That would be my advice. How do I develop my own unique style without falling into the film photography trends? Um, I would say don't worry about what's a trend. Worry about what you like shooting. If what you like shooting is trendy, all that matters is that you like shooting it. And, you know, people often will kind of criticize trends and stuff like that but i don't think anyone is out there like approaching their work thinking i really hate shooting this but it's popular so i'm gonna keep doing it right now i think people are just shooting the things that naturally interest them sometimes it's things that are popular sometimes it isn't so if you're trying to develop your style but you want to avoid trends i think you can only do that if you're actually interested in something that isn't a trend and i think it's just a matter of going out and shooting the stuff that kind of really makes you happy and not sitting here and trying to calculate things like is this trendy or isn't it and, and judging its value off of that. I would just kind of detach from that as much as possible. Photography exists outside of just the online world. So I think it's important to just really kind of focus on the work that you like the most. <laughs> Here's another good one. If you could only shoot one for the rest of your life, eight by 10 black and white or one 10 color. Again, I love these questions. I think they're hilarious. I would love to know like what, what conditions are we existing in where everything else <laughs> disappeared except these extremes? Um, but if I had to pick one, I would say eight by 10 black and white. But I would also ask who is paying? Am I getting all this stuff for free or do I still have to pay for the film? Because that would be a different story and I might pick 110. Okay, Fuji X100V or X-T4. Funny enough, I'm gonna do a video about this soon. I actually sold my X100F, which I owned, which I'm sure some of you knew. Uh, and now I have an X-T4, which is what I'm shooting on right now. Uh, it all comes down to the type of work you do. For me, I'm using the X-T4 as like a dual purpose camera. I'm using it for video work as well. That's why I switched to it. If I didn't do any video work at all, I may have been tempted to stick with the X100, but the X-T4 has uh, definitely impressed me so far and I will have a video out hopefully at some point in the near future just talking about why I like it so much. Okay, another X-T4 question. Would you trust the X-T4 for low budget video commercial work? 110%. Uh, so the I have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K and I also just got the 6K. Those are kind of my go-to cameras. Uh, I guess you would say for high-end work because the image is really nice out of those. Shoots internal raw. Um, the dynam dynamic range is great. The quality is great. But the X-T4 I bought, because I always need like a secondary camera that has autofocus and um, in-body stabilization just for kind of vlog stuff, flip screen and whatnot. But honestly, the X-T4 ended up 
uh, impressing me more than I thought it would from a, a video standpoint with the image quality, dynamic range, and just the look of the image. And I've ended up using it quite a bit. I've been really happy with it. I love Fuji glass, and I think the camera is super capable. You know, it's 10 bit internal, uh, 4K DCI holds up really nice when you grade it. So I would absolutely would recommend it for low budget commercial video work. What drew you away from more traditional landscapes to your work in the American Southwest? I've talked about this before. I'm sure if you've listened to my podcast or I think I've mentioned it on some videos, but I had just done traditional landscape photography for a long time and I became bored with it and it started to lead to some burnout. And you know, I discovered the American Southwest during a big road trip uh, on the road for 12 months, and it was just an entirely new landscape, and I approached it in a very different way, and it was just very refreshing, but I was just attracted to it instantly, and I think my falling out with the traditional landscape photography is just that the images I were was making were all kind of these like greatest hits where I was trying to have like the most dramatic light, the most dramatic composition, the most dramatic, you know, focal length to try and push these images on the viewer. And this type of work I started to approach in a very different way and it was just freeing and it started to feel like I could create a body of work that was more than just a single image. And yeah, the landscapes in the Southwest just really kind of captivated me. What was it that made you settle on a particular film stock and format such as the 6.7? Um, so like I said before, my way of working is kind of slower paced. I don't shoot a ton of images. Uh, so six by seven really is perfect for me. 10 images per roll uh, is quite a few. Sometimes I'll only go out and I'll shoot one roll of film. Uh, all depends kind of the mood I'm in. So it's often enough and I do love four by five and it is something I'm starting to shoot more of. Uh, but six, seven for me is just this perfect middle ground because the negative is still really big. I can get a huge scan out of a six, seven negative on the cool scan. Uh, big enough for like a 40 inch wide print with a ton of detail. So it's not limiting at all. Uh, and then yeah, 10 images per roll, like I said, is enough. So for me, I would never say go down to 645 or 35 because I don't necessarily need those extra frames. I actually just sold off my 645 camera. Uh, and actually 35 mil at times is kind of uh, daunting for me to try and finish a roll. It's just too many images. So uh, six by seven really kind of suits me. Uh, when it comes to a specific film stock, uh, Portra 400 is just what I started shooting when I was working in the Southwest and I really like the way it just rendered tones and colors, uh, but I'm starting to switch that up now. And I think it all depends on the landscape and I think it all just, you know, you got to give yourself time and experiment and try some different film stocks with whatever subjects you're photographing and then uh, see which one you like the best. So for me, that happens to be black and white right now, uh, which I never really have shot before, but just with the new landscape here in England, I feel like some of the color film I was shooting just wasn't working for me and I wasn't too happy with, uh, but black and white I feel like is really suiting this kind of current work that I'm doing. So uh, yeah, gonna keep rolling with that for now. Okay, how to ask strangers for portraits. And this is two questions from the same person. How to ask strangers for portraits and how to find subjects that are not abandoned motels or cars. So first one, um, how to ask strangers for portraits. Honestly, so many of us struggle with this, but it's the, it's the answer is so simple. You just ask. <laughs> and it's funny because I'll often look at photographers whose work I admire who, who are doing like portraits of strangers. And I'm like, oh, you know, like, how are they getting these images? And then you realize they're just asking the people and it's uncomfortable for everyone. So, you know, the other day I, I was out shooting. I made a portrait of this fella who was scuba diving, but I actually walked by him at first and I thought how much I would love to take his portrait. And then I kind of hung around and I was up the beach a bit. And then I was finally like, I'm just going to go ask. And I ended up making his portrait, but I definitely stalled quite a bit. So there's, you know, there's no secret at all. I think it's important that you just uh, maybe show interest in them first. You know, just walk up and say, can I make your image? So with this guy, I walked up. He actually asked me if I could take his photo of him and one of his clients who he had out there scuba diving. We chatted for a little bit and then I finally asked. I wasn't just like instantly like, I just want to take your photo and leave. So uh, important to show some interest as well in the person. Oh, second part of that, how to find subjects that are not abandoned motels or cars. Um, <laughs> I... This comes back to just shooting what you like. I like to shoot abandoned motels and cars, so I don't feel the need to find subjects that aren't them, uh, even though I am shooting some other stuff. But I would just say, go out and shoot what interests you. Whenever I go 
to a place, it's because it's somewhere I want to explore. And then I'm just naturally kind of gravitate towards the things that interest me. So it's hard to answer without knowing what you're into. But if you're into abandoned motels and cars and that's what you like shooting, then I would say just keep shooting that. How do you go about shooting by yourself? Have you always felt comfortable? I, for me to go out and create work that is important and that I feel like I'm happy with, I have to go out and shoot by myself. I can't go with other people because if there's any type of thing to pull me away from the image making, it just becomes a, a social event, which there's nothing wrong with, but I can't do both at once. So for me to go out and create meaningful work, it's gotta be by myself. And that's why even for when I'm out uh, creating these YouTube videos, I can't, I, I don't often create work that I'm happy with, uh, or not that I'm happy with, but that I would consider like important work for my portfolio because I'm flipping back between two things. I can't just immerse myself in the image making. So I would kind of compare that to if I went out with someone because, you know, my focus isn't purely the photography. I'm also there and I'm being social and chatting and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I have to go out by myself. It's really important and always has been throughout my entire uh, career. What do you do for a living? Is photography your main job? So, yes, this is my main job uh, for years. 10 or 12 years, I've done photography and filmmaking and video production, but things have shifted as of this year. So for a long time, I, I had a video production company. I ran with a partner and then had my own video production company. I did television uh, and I've done photography as well, but uh, started to fall out of that and really kind of lose my lose kind of my passion for it and not my interest. I still love filmmaking, video production, but the commercial side of things just wasn't fulfilling anymore. And, you know, I've been in this space for a while making content and it's always been, it's always felt like the most fulfilling work for me because my goal is just trying to make things that are is, are going to help people. So make content, uh, share my advice, share knowledge that I've picked up, share my experience and try and help people grow as artists. And it's honestly been the most fulfilling work that I've ever done. And that's why as of this year, I decided to kind of make the shift and pursue this full time. So uh, it is my full time gig. It's been a really interesting transition because from a business standpoint, uh, it's quite different than what I was used to in the commercial world before, just in terms of the business model and how you're doing things. But um, yeah, really enjoying it and excited to see where it goes. Okay, favorite lens for the Pentax 672. I only own two lenses. I have the 105 2.4 and the 75 2.8. I love both of them equally. The 105 2.4 obviously is a classic, amazing portrait lens. I've been using it for landscapes as well. Uh, really enjoy the look of it and also uh, how creative you can get with it with the shallow depth of field. And then I bought the 75 2.8. That focal length for me is almost perfect. Uh, and with those two, it's kind of you know, I often wouldn't go much wider and I often wouldn't go much longer. So I would say those two are kind of, uh, I enjoy them equally. Recommendations for trying to find shots in a small town in the UK with limited creative time. So obviously, again, I don't know what interests you, but if you have limited creative time, I would say just being really intentional with your time. So when you go out, you know, freeing yourself of any distractions, not checking social media, not texting or calling people or anything like that, just going out to create and that's it. And, you know, maybe going to a new place to explore, not getting too caught up with, you know, doing too much research and wondering if there's going to be anything, you know, anytime you go out to a place, you never know what uh, opportunities are going to present themselves. Go when there's interesting light, maybe times of the day you haven't been before, different weather. Um, yeah, just try and switch things up as much as possible. I think uh, that's what's really important. What is a Holy Grail camera that you've always wanted to try but never have owned or shot with? Um, honestly, the only one that comes to mind is, I think it's the Fuji GF617. So it's the, or not 617, 67. I don't know the exact name. It's the folder camera. It's 67 and 6x6. You can switch between the two. Uh, it was one of the last uh, rangefinders that Fuji made. It just looks like such a cool camera. But the problem is, is uh, it's pretty rare, super expensive. And I would never, since it's a rangefinder, I'd never replace the Pentax with it. So therefore I would never invest in it because it's way too much money. I couldn't afford to own both, but I would love to try that camera sometime. Uh, it really seems pretty amazing, especially for travel and stuff like that. If you could go back in time and shoot any film stock, which one and why? Um, I would have to say Kodachrome just because obviously it's legendary and you, even if you can find it nowadays, you can't get it developed. So uh, I would love to try that, you know, especially with being someone who shot color most of my career. I just think I, that would have to 100% be my pick. 
What are you looking forward to shooting in the UK? Honestly, I've really been enjoying exploring a lot of the coastal areas. Obviously, it's been tough right now just with COVID and lockdowns and stuff like that. Uh, but I've always been a huge fan of the coast. And here, the cool thing in the UK, obviously, is, you know, you're so close to it wherever you are, whichever direction you drive, you'll eventually end up there. And, you know, for me back in Canada, you had to at times drive really far to get to the coast. So I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities here uh, to discover some neat towns. So I've been doing a lot of research and trying to visit some of these coastal towns. And that's what this initial project I'm doing is kind of based around. Uh, so that is one of them. The second thing I'm really excited to go and explore kind of northern Scotland, some of the islands. Um, off of the coast. I've been doing a lot of research about those places, just about their history and about some interesting areas that uh, I really want to go and try and document. So as soon as we can travel a little more, uh, that's where I'm going to be headed. Okay, so next question is, do you have another source of inspiration akin to Instagram? I feel like this platform is slowly dying with Facebook. I always find it interesting when people say stuff like that. And obviously, I don't know kind of the position you're in and stuff like that. But, you know, for me, really, the online world for social media is Instagram and a little bit of YouTube. And I, I actually really enjoy it. I don't think it's dying. I feel like there is, you know, a lot of people sharing some great work on there. There's a good community, you know, a lot of people kind of supporting one another. I often wonder, you know, you hear people complain about social media at times, not saying that's exactly what you're doing, but you hear people talk about, you know, algorithms and, you know, Instagram isn't what it used to be and stuff like that. And I often kind of feel like sometimes people are saying that because maybe they aren't happy with how things are, um, like the results they're getting from like a social media standpoint, if they want to grow their following again. I'm not saying this is your situation, but I think it's important to talk about, you know, and then people will start kind of picking away at the flaws of the actual platform to say why they don't like it. But, you know, I, I really do enjoy Instagram um, and that's really that. And, and YouTube for me are kind of the two that uh, I turn to the most for for inspiration. Best film stock to shoot by the beach or in harsh light. Obviously, I don't know if you're talking about uh, color or black and white. If you're talking about color, I would say Portra 400. Everyone knows that's such a flexible film stock uh, when it comes to latitude and stuff like that. So that would be my pick. Black and white, I'm still really new to that world. I've only shot HP5, but everyone tells me that HP5 is the Portra of the black and white world. And from the test I did, it seems very flexible. So I would also suggest that one. Have you tried shooting the speed graphic with the rangefinder? What's it like? I actually owned the crown graphic. I don't have it anymore, but uh, I never tried the rangefinder. For me, that would really kind of defeat the purpose of 4x5 for the work that I do. And also, you know, not really being a huge fan of rangefinders, it would probably just kill the experience. I, I like composing on that massive kind of ground glass when shooting 4x5. Okay, just got a Pentax digital spot meter. Any tips? I would say... Uh, if you aren't familiar with the zone system, try and learn about that. And then really just try and practice and train your eye for uh, picking out what's middle gray when you're out and about. Because really, you know, when you take a reading with a spot meter, it's going to tell you an exposure to make whatever tone you're reading look middle gray. So, you know, starting to train your eye to spot things that are middle gray uh, in a scene, that's really important. And then just understand also how other things work when it comes to uh, the zone system and taking readings and placing them at different points. Uh, and that'll help you kind of make certain decisions uh, when you're trying to calculate your exposure and stuff like that. So I would say practice, make notes, do some test stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's really something that you can pick up quite quickly if you take the time to kind of practice and understand things the best that you can. How do you decide between lab scanning and DSLR scanning? So I actually have never used uh, DSLR for scanning. So I can't really comment on that. Um, I would say it just comes down to like convenience and time. So I know for me with scanning at home, it's what I prefer because of the control and it's what I will do often for most of my say portfolio work. But sometimes when I'm just doing content for YouTube, I'll get lab scans done just because uh, from a time standpoint, they're so much more kind of economical. It, you know, scanning the other day, for some reason, I didn't pay for lab scans for a video I was doing. And it took me like half a day to scan all the images. It's just really time consuming. So I, I would say it all comes down to um, to timing. Although with that being said, like I said, I don't have much experience with digital SLR scanning. And I know that it can be quite a bit quicker uh, than using a, a scanner at home, especially a flatbed. 
because you aren't waiting uh, for the kind of scanner head to run over the negative. You're just kind of taking a picture of that frame so it can be quicker as well. But uh, yeah, that's about the best advice I could give on that one. So what are some tips beyond technical steps that you give to those wanting to start filmmaking? I would say just really store, uh, story and structure, study those things. It's really easy to get caught up in the technical side of things, especially nowadays, you know, gear is more capable than it's ever been and it's cheaper than it's ever been. And people are starting to just pick things apart with like comparisons about specs and milliseconds of movement and all this crazy stuff. And it can make you forget that, you know, a film that's shot on the world's most expensive camera, if it has a, a terrible story and the editing's bad and the pacing's bad, it's just going to be bad. It doesn't matter how good the gear is. So, you know, watch things you like, make notes, take the time to watch them a second or a third time and pause them and, you know, really analyze why things are working or why, why they aren't working and stuff like that. And I think that's a really good way to kind of pick things up quickly. Next question, what has more impact to you, aspect ratio or resolution? This is an interesting one. Uh, impact, I'm assuming you're meaning on a, on a finished image. And for, if I had to choose one or the other, I would say resolution, just because uh, if you have more resolution, you can just crop. An aspect ratio is something you can decide afterwards. Uh, on the computer, if, you're, if you have a digital post workflow, whereas... Um, say if you're sacrificing re resolution for a specific aspect ratio, then you're really kind of locked into that. So I would always go for the more resolution and then you can kind of make your aspect ratio choices later if that's how you want to work for some reason. Okay, next one is what is the best way to scan 35 millimeter film, both scanner and program? I would say avoid a flatbed and buy a dedicated film scanner if you can. I have never been happy with the results scanning 35 millimeter on a flatbed. I find the negatives too small and it can't resolve enough detail. You really have to sharpen it hard. Um, I know people do use flatbeds for it, so maybe uh, it all comes down to personal preference, but I've heard really good things about picking up a dedicated film scanner, especially if you want to use something like a Nikon CoolScan 5000, which is pretty much one of the best ones out there. But you could also go, I think Plastec makes one and Optic Film makes uh, a version as well, which are cheaper and people seem to be pretty happy with. Um, software, again, they all kind of do the same thing. It just comes down to which interface you like the best, which workflow kind of jives with you the best. I use ViewScan and Negative Lab Pro and I've been super happy with the results from that. Uh, and that would be my suggestion, but you'd have to try it out and see uh, how much you enjoy it yourself. Okay, last one. Do you really need a light meter or can you use your phone or a digital camera? So I would recommend a light meter for sure, uh, just because not only is it going to be the most accurate, but it's also going to help you understand reading light in a scene and how to read tones and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, there are film shooters out there who use digital cameras to get an idea about exposure. Uh, and then there are, are also uh, light meter apps on the phone, which can work good as well but it all depends on the lighting situations uh what you're shooting as well uh so it's a it's a tough one to answer you would just need to try some out and see what worked best for you but i would say you know if you can afford it i would 100 percent recommend getting a light meter even a cheaper incident style light meter because it's going to force you to learn how to kind of place where to place that in the scene and how to read tones and that's only going to make you um more skilled as a photographer but if you're just starting out and you can't afford it I would say pick up a light meter app. They're free, test it out. They usually work pretty good. Okay, so that wraps that up. Uh, if you made it to the end, thank you. I know that was a bit of a longer one. Like I said, I want to put the timestamp so you could jump around to a specific question if you wanted, but I hope that helps. Uh, for anyone who submitted questions, thank you. I hope I answered it and did a good job and uh, yeah, helped you understand things a little bit better, whatever you were curious about. But I do plan on doing some more of these in the future. Like I said, I'm going to include some of these questions in those field notes that I send out. So check out the link below and sign up for that if you're interested. But yeah, until next time, thank you all for watching. Always appreciate the support and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.